Hello and welcome to uh, this particular episode of a podcast that we like to call You Should Have Been Here Last Week. Not just us. Fellow... <laughs> yeah, <laughs> lots of other people call it as well. They have uh, to. Which, my... <laughs> which myself and fellow comedian Paul Ricketts interview the movers and shakers, Quakers and I don't know what else rounds with Bakers. Makers. Uh, of Makers, yeah. Of the comedy scene, um, and this week our very special guest is Stephen Grant, uh, famous for um, founding and running for many, many years, I think over 20 years, uh, the Comedia in both Brighton um, and a latterly expanded to Bath. His new place is called The Forge, uh, because That's right, uh, yes. in, t- in terms of his Brighton club, because he had to leave the Comedia in Brighton. Yeah. I mean, he left under uh, very cloudy circumstances, which um, uh, we can't really uh, talk about. Um, well, we could. <laughs> <laughs> but then we should have asked him, really, to talk about it. And we didn't. Yeah, we should have asked him. So, uh, we, we can't talk maybe. about it if we hadn't asked him about it. So, <laughs> Yeah, maybe we should do that next time. Yeah, in fact, we but will. This was recorded a few uh, weeks ago, and it was via the uh, magic of Zoom, but uh, Stephen Grant was in Australia performing at the Adelaide Comedy Festival, so there are lots of sort of yes. moments, aren't there? Yes, Zoom it does freezes. freeze a bit. I mean, the technology, great though it is, couldn't really um, deal with the other side of the world. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> it makes it more international, I think, <laughs> with the delay yeah. in it. Of course, obviously, people who are listening to the podcast, this will make absolutely no difference to you at all because we've yeah. edited all those silences out and made it sound wonderful. It's just for the people who are watching this on YouTube or on Spotify, you, you will find that perhaps Stephen Grant's face could move more than it does. So, this is Stephen Grant live from Australia. This morning, because it is this morning, just for I'd uh, say this for our guest, Stephen Grant, who's in Australia, who's speaking to us live from some part of Australia, probably the coast, a Brighton institution, I would say. 20 plus years you ran the Crater Club, and now you've started a new one, yeah. The Forge, and good afternoon to you, isn't it? Yeah, hello. It was good afternoon. It's five past four. Uh, you say it's minus one where you are. Yeah. It's actually, yeah, just check, it's minus one of the web temperature I thought it was. I thought it was 30. It's actually 29. Oh. So a bit chilly. <laughs> and I, I'm not kidding, but I've got a little in here because <laughs> it's, uh, it's just dropped to 29 degrees. <laughs> That's the only reason I mentioned the temperature is to give you the opportunity to gloat. <laughs> Mate, yeah. it's not comfortable. It's not it's not nice. It's really, it's really unpleasant. It's too warm. It's a stupid country. <laughs> Who decided to build a city in oven? Stupid, stupid, stupid. The first question we want to ask is, why uh, did you become a comedy promoter? What, what, what made you do it? Mm. So the reasons behind being a comedy promoter, I think, varies from different people. And obviously, the purpose of your podcast, you're probably going to get the broad spectrum. Mm. Um, I think it's keen to point out that a lot of people become comedy promoters and no, no one will ever admit this but because they love comedy but they're not very good at doing it uh, and so therefore they would love to still be involved in it mm. they get to know a lot of comedians while they desperately try to be funny themselves and eventually realize that their business acumen and their ability to make connections with comedians makes them a much more viable promoter than performer however it, in, in, in my case, I'd like to think it's not like that. Uh, in my case, it was because not living in London in the late 90s, which is when I started doing comedy, it was difficult to become a new act. Um, there wasn't a circuit where I lived on the south coast in Brighton. Uh, uh, there was a comedy club there um, called The Crocodile, uh, and it was uh, on a Thursday night. There was no concept of new act nights or open spots or anything like that. So, yeah, so doing five minutes every month, not good enough. So um, so I would have to travel up to London 
to do um, open mic spots to try and get better and better. But it was laborious and it was lengthy and it was not always straightforward because I had a job as well, which I had to commute to. And that job wasn't anywhere near anywhere. There was any comedy and it was expensive. So the whole reason why I started running comedy nights is because it was the only way I could get regular stage time was to put on my own shows. So before the media came along uh, and so I was doing that, uh, I had a variety of different comedy nights in Brighton. Uh, I did one at the Font and Firkin, which is uh, one of those Font pubs, you know, those Firkin pubs. Yeah. Uh, and that yeah, was yeah. Uh, eye-wateringly bad. Uh, and then I did one in an internet cafe, uh, a gig called Virtual Hilarity. <laughs> um, you know, if you're going to have a pun based on what's going on. I mean, to give you an idea of how long ago this was, our middle act on one of the bills was Mickey Flanagan. He sent us half sport photo, like literally <laughs> one that was two and a half centimetres by two and a half centimetres. We're looking at it and we're going, how do we blow this up to a poster? <laughs> That's all he had wow. in, in 1998, that was. Martin Davis opening, Mickey Flanagan in the middle, A incognito closing. Uh, so yeah, I mean, so and then I had one there, and I had one in a few little pub function rooms. So and they were all just designed to get me as much stage time as possible. Uh, what so what happened with the comedian then? When did they when did they enter the picture? My final gig that I was running, I was working with a company called Helter Skelter, who were music promoters, and they were nice people, but they didn't really know what they're doing in comedy, and they used to get quite stressed about the fact that it didn't always sell. Um, and what they did is they booked the acts from a big agency called Off the Curb that we obviously we know, but maybe the listeners don't know. Um, and they would have me host it so that I would do that. And uh, I was in a place called the Zap. And the Zap used to actually have comedy in. I mean, in the late in the late eighties, early nineties, it was yeah. um, Julian Clary. But Julian Clary was then called the Joan Collins Fan Club. That's right. So I played there many times. The Zap club, yeah. Well, there you go. Well, you do back then and then it became a nightclub in its own right and then they tried to put comedy on midway it didn't really work like all nightclubs the reason why it doesn't work is it's freezing it's designed for people dancing on drugs who are a lot warmer than people sat still listening to someone tell jokes i decided i wanted to try and do something um myself and not with them the comedia had, were, were previously on manchester street in a small theater and they'd moved to a much bigger space in the basement on um, Gardner Street, which is in the lanes. Um, so I approached them and asked if I could do a Sunday night comedy night, uh, once uh, a fortnight. I wanted once a month. I thought if I asked for once a fortnight, and they just say, well, look, it's only be once a month, and I would have got what I want. So I asked for once a fortnight. And then when I went to see the venue, they took us down the stairs, and they took me into a space that didn't have a floor, just had six pillars holding up the ceiling, and it was a <laughs> hole in the ground. And uh, and that's where the name the crater came from. Ah, because when the huh. first time I saw it, it was just a just a hole in the ground. And they said to me, I remember I remember getting an email from Marina, one of the owners, saying, "Look, we're just we're happy to put regular stand up comedy. We've already got shows on Saturday. They had like they had a like a cabaret show on a Saturday, and they had a kind of a." They had a sort of a, um, a, a gay-friendly comedy night called Screamers as well. Um, and they said, but, like, we don't really want it to be very end of the pier. You know, this has got to be. And I said, no, no, of course it's not going to be like that, you know. But, of course, they didn't know what I would do. And so, yeah, so they, so they let me run this night. Uh, on the very first night, we put Dominic Holland to close. Two hundred pounds in in nineteen ninety nine. Oh, that's depressing, isn't it? Really, because the money is the the money hasn't gone up in twenty four years. Yeah, Yeah. that's why I mentioned it. That's why I mentioned it. (laughs) Oh God. Yeah, yeah. It's and the funny thing about it is, is it's a bit like being paid. You remember when you'd like an open spot and they goes like, "We can't give you money, we'll give you a few drinks and some food." Any gig that gave you drinks and food has actually gone up in value in line with inflation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So Dominic Holland was the first one. It was the last last Sunday in June in 1999. And then we got 40 people in. And for the next show, we got 80 people. So we got uh, 120. The next we got 160. And the next one we got 200. And then every show after that sold out. Because it was a good show. Oh, and and, yeah. and by then, I'd done two years of comparing, and I'd got good at it. 
Um, so it was like, you know, and, and I was local. And, and actually, I know it seems daft when you talk about stand up comedians, you know, oh my God, you can reel them off. You know, um, myself, Dan Evans, George Egg, Simon Evans, Zoe Lyons, Jen Brister, uh, Paul Zenon, um, um, you know, Joe Foster, Michael Fabry. Oh, God, there's so, there's so many. But then it was just me. <laughs> yeah, so that was it. Now, they liked the fact it was a local, a local host. What gives you the most amount of pleasure uh, from booking a comedy night? What, what sort of really makes it for you? I would say that the joy I get from performing and promoting are closer aligned now than they were then. I think back then, the buzz I got from performing was literally that, the buzz, that feeling of I've made people laugh, you get off stage, you got that kind of fizzy, kind of almost that slightly sort of high feeling yeah. you get from like, you know, being alive on the stage. And I'm not saying it goes, but it, you get used to it. And then, and then realistically, what you enjoy being on stage is a job well done, you know, a, a joke well delivered, a, a show professionally executed. Whereas promoting the joy comes from the overall sense of everything went well and you promoted it well. Whereas now I'd say they're both kind of professional, really. Yeah. So if you had a choice, let's say that um, you had to give up promoting due to some sort of uh, accident that happened in the club involving livestock and you had to stop <laughs> doing any sort of promoting, but you're allowed to perform. So uh, would you would you feel gutted by that, or would you rather just uh, stop performing and keep promoting? It's so weird, isn't it? Because you know what, Paul. I mean, apart from the fact that your example is weird. Yes. Um, yeah. I, I you like all comedians. You have time free in the day to sit and dwell and and imagine some appalling doom related upshot to their life that was not realistic. Hmm. Nearly all of my doom based scenarios involved me not being able to perform anymore but still yeah. being able to promote the reality of it is because i'm currently still helping to run a comedy club right now while i'm eight hours ahead on a laptop in australia i'm certainly not going to be able to commute back and compare it mm. so you know promoting is one of those jobs that you can do anyway we, we all know people who are running clubs in the uk that moved abroad you know it, it doesn't actually require a huge amount to run something mediocrely uh, you just need to be quite hands off to do it well. So, in the case of your bizarre scenario in which I can no longer promote, mm. but I can continue to, and by the way, that almost exclusively comes when you, um, if you want to give us a, a better example than the livestock one, that would be the one where you run a club, it goes horribly wrong, mm. and you don't pay anyone, and then nobody ever works for you again. Uh, so we, know, we know people have done that one. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, oh, there's I mean, several, well, that, there's several of the them. Yeah. That's, yeah, exactly. Well, that's the one that you can't, kind of, that's the one that pops up time and time again. Mm. You know, and those are the people who can still theoretically perform but can't uh, promote anyone. Um, uh, in that scenario, what, what are you asking? In that situation, what am I, what am I supposed to be doing? Uh, well, I, I basically, I think the whole thing is a simple choice. Which one do you like uh, most? I think that's what I'm trying to ask in a very complicated I way. Can, I can see myself promoting until I die. Mm. I can't see myself performing forever. Um, the reason why is, well, actually, it's about threefold. I think the first reason uh, is because is that when you run comedy clubs, uh, you know, there are two types of shows when it comes to stand-up. One of them is the package where you have a compare and various acts, and that's how people cut their teeth. It can't be brilliant. One of them is the touring show where you go and see your favourite act, and they might have a support act, but ultimately you're going to see them. Mm. Now, all the comedians that have reached that upper echelon, as you two both know, have a following, and they take those followings with them. But those followings get old with them. So, you know, if you're Tommy Tin, you know, and you're I'm 50 now, but you got big when you were like in your mid 30s. When you were in your mid 30s and you were big, the people watching you were in their mid 20s to late 20s and they'd grown up with you. So it doesn't make any difference that you're older because the age difference between you and the people who are watching you are the same. However, if you're doing a package comedy show, you're selling yourself as a fun night out for people who want to have a fun night out. There's no reason why that doesn't have to include 50 year olds and 60 year olds or 20 year olds and 30 year olds, but that product is always pitched to the same people yeah. so they 
that audience stays the same age, but you get older. And as your age and references and life experience and energy gets further and further from theirs, you need to make sure you're constantly relevant. You need to make sure you have the empathy of knowing how that comes across. You know, when I started out in comedy, I was in my early 20s. I used to do jokes about sex. And I was playing to a load of people in their mid-30s and me going, what do you know? You know nothing. I was so young. <laughs> Whereas now, if I make jokes about sex people in their early 30s, it's slightly weird and distasteful for them to hear a bloke <laughs> in his late 40s, early 50s go on about it. So yeah. there's there are everything from material to pitch to presentation varies and based on that. So so the answer to that is like, I don't think I would perform forever because, because that discrepancy needs to go. Second reason is it's just a personal one. It's like, you know what it's like, Steve. You go and do a gig somewhere that's about 100 miles from home, so it's going to be a two-hour drive. Then you get off stage, and then you pack away your guitar and stuff, and then you walk to your car park, and you pay your parking, you get in your car, and you drive home. And you've got off stage at 11, and you're back in the car for 11.20, and you're home. Because they've closed some of the motorways in the way home, you're home at half past one in the morning, and you walk your front door. And instead of being somebody who is buzzing on the adrenaline of showbiz, you're a bloke who is looking at what they're going to do with their retirement, who's still coming home from work at 20 to 2 in the morning. Yeah. And your little part of you just goes, this doesn't seem sustainable. <laughs> and I think if you're a comedy club promoter, mm. you can you can work a normal job effectively. To you, yeah. you know, and you still have to pick up the phone from comics going, I've lost the keys to the hotel. And I think the third reason why I could not perform forever, not present, uh, uh, but, but, but promote forever, is that I don't think in promotion you hit a ceiling. I think you can constantly learn ways of doing it better and better and better, be it innovation or the quality of the shows or the quality of the room. But I think in performing, I think we all have to admit there is a maximum talent threshold we all have. And whereas, you know, we always have the bad habit of being a bit competitive and comparing ourselves to other kinds like, are we better than them? Are we worse than them? All you should ever do is compare yourself to yourself a year ago. And I always promised myself that if I was, if I, if a year in comedy had passed and I wasn't better than I was a year ago, I would probably wind it up and knock it on the head because I'm no longer improving. Now, I've revised that plan to make it four years thanks to COVID. <laughs> so <laughs> I have to be better than I was in uh, 2019 this year in order for me to consider the fact that I'm still improving. I don't see a point in banging out a talent, even if you enjoy it, if you're not getting any better. Because you'll get tired and you'll get dead in the eyes. And in the heyday of jonglers, when you can have a really good income doing the same material in the same way to the same audience, to the same looking rude everywhere, it yeah. it, it rewarded um, staleness. Yeah. You know, it, yeah. It, it meant that if you came up with something that was that was that just didn't go badly, didn't have to be brilliant, just didn't go badly and did it everywhere, you continued to work. And I just think that kind of yeah, you know, yeah, it was bad when genres went. A lot of people lost their livelihoods and everything like that. But the, but the, we should never reward mediocrity in a art form and comedy, despite being an industry and a business as an art form. Um, and we're all responsible for being better. Yeah. Absolutely true. I mean, what would you say going back to the the promoting thing. I mean, have you got any tips for anybody that wants to be a promoter? What What's your top tip to give to anybody that wants to start their own club or their own comedy night? What are the do's and the mm. don'ts? I think the first do is, is actually, unlike doing stand-up comedy, it is absolutely fine to be generic. There is a reason why we have the formats we have of act, interval, act, interval, act. There is a reason why a comedy show is two and a quarter hours and not five. Mm. You know, there is a reason why people aren't stood. There is a reason why there isn't music in the background while the acts are on. There is a reason why the windows are closed, the doors are closed. There's a reason why the bar doesn't serve all acts are on. If you go to a comedy club and you see how they do it, and you're a punter and you think, I want to run my own comedy night, and then you have an idea for something they didn't do it that night that you think would be better. You're probably wrong. <laughs> but many people probably do, though. Don't they? I mean, we we all know. 
you you go to we all go somewhere. Yeah, we, we all go and do a gig somewhere where the promoter says, "Oh yeah, yeah, no, we've got this little bit actually where um, uh, off the first act before the interval, we come out and we do this tombola, and then your heart sinks and goes, ah." Oh. And they go, no, 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 they really love it. They really love it. And he's like, tell you what, though, the second and third acts never really have a really good time. For some yeah. reason, the show doesn't go really well. They get quite tired towards the end as well, actually. Yeah. yeah. So we need a really high energy act. Or maybe get rid of the 30 minute Tom Butler and raffle. Yeah. It doesn't deserve to be in a comedy night. So, you know, there is a reason why that format exists in the way it does, is because it's been tried and tested. I know it varies from place to place. I yeah. know you go to places like the um, the, the Ballon Banana and there's no compare, um, but it's a tougher gig as a result of it. I know that, you know, um, the is. comedy store has two acts and interval two acts instead of act, interval, act, interval, act, but because they literally their venue is in the middle of where all the theatres are and the whole idea of one interval is standard for theatres. So there is there are variations, don't get me wrong. And there's always stuff you can do to make promotion better, but there's a thousand things you can do to make it worse. So start with the tried and tested. Start with the tried and tested and make sure that any improvements you're making are based on the fundamental tenets of comedy. The fundamental tenets of comedy are as follows. You only hear the comic. You only see the comic. You only face the comic. And you remove every possible distraction that stops any of the above happening. So no sound leaking. Don't make it too hot. Don't make it too cold. Right. Don't, you know, make sure the act is really well lit. And I don't just mean get one of the lights in the ceiling and point it at them. I mean the spotlight. <laughs> Why do we need a spotlight? So we can see their face. Why do we need their face? Because the inflections and uh, and the appearance of the comic's face while they're telling a joke is imperative to the joke. So all this, you know. I mean, I remember doing a corporate once and I said, have you got a PA, a sound system? He goes, what do you need? I goes, well, the basics, I need a microphone. And they sent me a link. They said, would this do? And they sent me a link to a 15 pound joke karaoke microphone you get off Amazon, which had a speaker in the actual shaft oh, of the microphone. You put in two AA batteries and it play out music. And I said, well, no, I need a professional PA. And it goes, how is this any different? <laughs> <laughs> and I thought it was a joke. I know what I uh, goes. Yeah, good point. Yes, I've always said that promoting comedy is really easy to do badly, right? And also, this also includes, by the way, right. So, per- permanent built comedy clubs, on the whole, tend to be the best places to see comedy because they've removed all of those variables that take away from the experience. Yeah, sound, the light, the, the you know, all the rest of it. You know, like even things like having the doors to the toilet near the stage. You want the bar as far from the stage as possible, probably not in the side. You want the toilets away from it. So if someone goes to the toilet, they walk away from the stage, not towards it. All these things happen in comedy clubs. And yet when I tell people this, they're always kind of like, well, does it make a difference? I'm like, yeah, there's a reason why they're like this. So, you know, so if anyone wants to support a comedy night, be you know, however, the most important thing for any comedy night, and this is, this is the weird thing, because this is the one that nearly all promoters forget about the fact, is that in order for the gig to go well, the audience have to be in a good mood. And um, I remember the old Jonglers Portsmouth, right? Oh, now, God. it was a tough as hell gig. So tough, incredibly <laughs> tough. But, you know, you, you try and work out the reasons why. Because it was a per- that was a purpose-built comedy club, right? So why was it so bad? And you think, is it because it's in Portsmouth? And you think a little part of you, maybe it can be quite an aggressive sort of confrontational place. But actually, there are gigs in Portsmouth is it attracting the wrong people. Well, quite possibly. But then is it the layout of the room? It had a huge ceiling so they could squeeze people onto a mezzanine. Comedy wants a low ceiling. So the last stays in and your sight lights stay in one place. Could be that as well. But actually, I think the reason was is because they weren't treated like guests. They were treated like cattle. Yeah. And they got in, the, 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 the security were mean to them on the way in. They made them queue outside. Sometimes it's cold and wet. They came in, they were put into seats like that. The drinks, you know, the, the, the process for queuing for drinks was full of people on minimum wage who were bored and not invested in comedy. They didn't, there were very few people who cared about the comedy. So you got the impression that comedy wasn't loved here. What was interesting was, is that, you know, that Jonglers Network was brought up by, you know, was, was started by people who were super passionate about comedy and they came up with a manual on how to do it and they sent it to everybody. I know this from what's happened with me in Brighton and other places is that when comedy is done by people who don't love comedy, 
doesn't matter how many of the boxes they tick to do the job that you're supposed to do, it dies, right? Because there needs to be someone who's invested in it going well, because that is the fundamental reward. Because we'd all make more money just selling drink. We'd all make money selling burgers. You know, comedy has to be loved in order to flourish, regardless of how well, you know, it goes. And actually, in, with the Forge Comedy Club, every single person who works with me has got one thing in common, and that is they love comedy. It's mm. literally the thing that gets you to sit down and have a little interview with me before the job starts. You don't love comedy. It doesn't matter how competent you are, you're not going to do it. It would be like running a music venue, wouldn't it, with someone that hates pop music? You know, they sat down and said, I don't like bands. Well, what are you doing working here? You know, that the Portsmouth <laughs> one was funny because I, I they used to ask you to do 12 minutes, didn't they? But then what would happen is you do your 12 minutes, it would go, okay. You think, well, got away with that. And then you'd bump into someone on the way out and they'd come and say, oh, I really enjoyed your stuff. Yeah, sorry about the people near me who were talking loads, you know, like that. But I thought you were great. Such a shame you did a short bit. I've come all the way over from Fairham because I'm a real fan of comedy. And it's a shame you could do more. And you'd go home feeling a bit gutted. I know. Because yeah. the venue and the people who sat near them and the, 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 the system for running it were working against you. And what you do in those situations, you say, well, look, I'm going to be doing this gig near you. And it's a great gig in a lovely theatre. Come along for that. And, of course, those people then would would gravitate away from journalism. It would become a self-fulfilling prophecy. That's the thing, you see. It's like when people get up on stage in front of a very quiet room and they have a go at the audience and it's quiet. I'm going, never have a go at the audience. They're the people who turned up. Yeah. They're the people. It's not their fault. They turned up. You know, um, it's the people who didn't turn up as a fault and they're not there to have a go at them. You know, you reward the people who turned up. So I always I always think, you know, you you know, the, the prerequisites of being a great promoter is you, you love comedy and you understand how it should work. But the way to make it great, the way to make it the way to the way to, to always improve, empathize with what it's like being a member of the audience. You've got to know what it's like to listen and watch that show. Because if you don't, you never know how to make it better. You know? yeah. and, and that involves just not going home at five o'clock, which is some people who run <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah. I mean, what, could you describe your audience, Steve? What, what do you say that your audience is? In, in the Forge? Yeah. yeah. I've, got, I've got a few little pop-up ones in villages as well and a few others and stuff like that. Well, I think, you know, the best way to describe them is, is the kind of people who are still mostly on Facebook. So they're all that like, <laughs> shit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So they are. They are. They're of that age. They're um they're in their mid to late thirties or early forties. But they're people who want a night out, but are quite pleased they can sit down. And they want to have a laugh, but they're quite pleased they don't have to chat. And they want a really nice glass of wine, right? Mm. And they're quite pleased that the toilet has got a seat on it. <laughs> right. Okay. And they're just they want the night out experience without it being like a fucking festival. You know, they don't want to be crapping in a trench. They don't want to be queuing for half an hour. They, they want it to be nice, you know. And so that 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 is the kind of person that still wants a night out, but doesn't want one where you have to slum it in order to have it, you know. And they tend to be in their 30s and 40s. Yeah. Okay. Well, we're getting towards the end here. I was going oh. to ask you one last question, but you've, you've only got a minute to answer it, which is about the future of stand-up. What do you what do you think about the future of it? Oh, right. Okay, right. So let's try and do this in a minute. So I'm going to talk yeah. really, really quickly. So the future of stand-up is as follows. Stand-up comedy as a packaged form needs to exist in the way it goes. Yeah. Everybody right now thinks it's all about getting online stuff and online content up. But the problem with that, it's a bit like everyone going to Edinburgh. What happens? Nobody sees you. So when everybody puts something online, then all that happens is you're a nobody. If you don't put anything online, it's the same as having a website. When nobody had a website... You know, uh, it didn't make a difference. When you had a website, oh, you were a try When everyone has a website, it's just weird if you don't have one. So that is the way that's going to work. Packaged comedy will still need to exist in some way, shape or form. And comedy clubs will still continue to thrive. But getting people through the door more and more requires people to have what's effectively a presence that they can review because it allows people to check something before they go out. And I honestly believe that all those people who have got huge from doing reels and Instagram and all that, you know, like, and TikTok and stuff like that, because they haven't got their chops on the circuit yet, are going to bring the overall quality down. So there will be a migration back 
to comedy clubs. If you're a hot water comedy, you set out because you're hot water, not because of the acts that's on it. So what will thrive in this situation? Very established comedy clubs and very established comedians. Great. I think you've done that's it. That's what we want to hear. <laughs> in a minute as well. So Brilliant. thanks. Thanks for coming on, uh, Steve. Yeah, thanks, Have Steve. a lovely show to later on to, uh, this afternoon in Australia. Yeah. Cheers, Stephen. Bye. Bye. See you, guys. Bye. Bye. Uh, so that was Stephen Grant, and I think an incredibly interesting interview and very thoughtful. Made me think about a few yeah. things. Uh, should we move on to our love of words and the comedy lexicon? Oh, yes. So the words or phrase I want to choose... Uh, this this time is comedy literate. Oh yes, it's often said by uh, promoters when they um, are trying to entice you to their gig in uh, bumfuck in the middle of nowhere, and they say it's great though. You know, I, I know it takes eight hours to get there by yak, but the audience very comedy comedy literate. You know, oh they're ever so comedy literate, mm. which you just get a warm glow inside, don't you think? Oh, they're gonna. But that can mean different things to different people, can't it, comedy literates? I just want them to laugh. I don't even care if they laugh in the wrong places. I'm just, yeah. <laughs> I'm just happy to hear them laugh. I always think that comedy uh, literate uh, is it's a shorthand for they're a bit middle class, really. They, you know, they're, yeah, they're, yeah, they're nice people. Yeah, you, know, you won't be but frightened also, of when, them. When, yeah, when promoters say they're comedy literate, and the other one they always say, "Oh, it's great here. They like their comedy." I'm thinking, well, I fucking hope they do. <laughs> you just go, I mean, mind you, there are there are certain places mentioning no names uh, on, on that. You know, we all know the gigs where you walk in, and it's like that uh, muscle, not muscle memory. Yeah, you, you know, you you blank out a trauma, but when you come back to the gig, you suddenly remember, oh god, I remember what this gig is like. The much mentioned uh, Jonglers Portsmouth, which I'm glad it doesn't exist anymore because we have coated it so much in every single episode. Jonglers Portsmouth gets a going over. Um, yeah. So to get back to your original point about uh, all oh, they like comedy here at Jonglers Portsmouth, sometimes they didn't. <laughs> Some people oh, in no, the audience. I think there was, a, there was an active. Uh, uh, there was actually hatred. <laughs> They hated comedy. And a lot of them, I mean, let's face it, a lot of them were there on freebies anyway. You know? Yeah. And we're waiting uh, for I the mean, disco. Yeah, but comedy literacy is like, well, uh, it's like that thing. And in a way, it, it goes back to the thing that we've often discussed before, the idea that there is a sort of um, an internal brotherhood or, you know, uh, almost like the Illuminati of comedy that know everything. Mm. You know, and they always have a show at the Edinburgh Festival and they're so clever. And, and unless you understand that, you can't be part of the... Which I just think is... Really, I, and I think the middle class thing, yeah, you're spot on. So, you know, working class audiences, obviously they're all stupid and thick. And they yeah. can't they can't be part of that sort of... Uh, the, receiving the pearls of wisdom. Oh. Yeah, but they just laugh, but they don't really know why they're laughing, no, do they? they? Not compared it's to terrible. the comedy yeah. literate people. And they laugh and <laughs> have a deep knowledge of why they're laughing. Do you know what? The, the obverse of that, though, is that I once did a gig at, um, the, I think it was the Glee Club in Nottingham, and um, and this was, this was in the early 2000s, but, and I think there was a spate of it at the time that these blokes, they were all pissed, they were there doing a, a stag night, and they said, oh, yeah, mate, mate, uh, it's really good. He said, we had our... Uh, and the, he put a piece of paper and they had like loads of words on it. Did you know that that was a phenomenon as well, that people were playing comedy bingo? And she's going, uh, we, yeah, he said, you, you didn't mention the word kebab. <laughs> they had them all. <laughs> they had them all. He said, you didn't say knob. Yeah. He said, but you did say girlfriend. I said, oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, fair enough. And they said, you know, I, I'm very disappointed. I, you know, I, I was three away. And apparently that, that was a thing <laughs> in the sort of like mid noughties I actually had a club where we gave out the cards to the audience members. Oh, did you? <laughs> it was an open um, open mic night for new comics. And to keep the audience interested, <laughs> we had a prize of a bottle of wine. And we handed out cards with, uh, with certain phrases and things that we thought. Oh my God! That... <laughs> I presume, by the way, that the acts were in on this, or did they not know? Uh, they didn't know. Oh God! 
They only knew when uh, they got there, and sometimes they only knew when someone shouted house, and then we had to stop their act to give the person the prize. <laughs> oh, dear. You know what, going back to comedy literate, I mean, the opposite of that is, you know, comedy, comedy illiterate. Yeah. What the hell is that? Yeah, I mean, they should get angry at, at, at every punchline. Get some angry and angrier. <laughs> I did a gig once when I was promoting and we had a group of six women that were sat in the front and um, didn't laugh at anything. And I asked them, because I was emceeing it, and I said, well, you know, how do you know each other, uh, you six miserable women? And they wouldn't really say what it was. And, yeah. and then at the end of the night, um, I went up to them and said, look, come on, tell me, how do you know each other? And they said, well, um, basically, we're all members of a uh, postnatal depression class. And uh, this is our first night out. And thank you for a wonderful evening. <laughs> Sorry. I mean, on one hand, that is a wonderful story. but it's also... <laughs> So, yeah, comedy literate is, the, uh, is quite a snobby term, isn't it, really? And it means very little. It just means that I'm the sort of act that needs to have people who know what a joke is. Um, I think most people do, don't they? To me, it smacks of that attitude where, um, you know, you've got people going to see bands and you wonder why they bother because they're, they're just stand there going, oh, this is shit. <laughs> you know, and it, that was probably the whole staff of the enemy for about 30 years, wasn't it? Having said that, oftentimes the negative reviews were very funny, weren't they? Oh, much better to yeah. write than the positive ones. As an ex-music yeah. journalist, um, yeah. I even uh, made up gigs. That I I had made up a band, Tarby's Gang what? was the name of the band. I, uh, I had a mate who had one eye, and uh, I put him in a bowler hat and took him to this uh, West End venue. Took a photo of him on stage and then made up a whole review of uh, Tarby's Gang <laughs> and got paid for it. What sort of music did they play? I, I don't know. I got away with this. I said that the band passed round uh, a bowl which turned out to be containing magic mushrooms and handed them out to the audience. So in the end, I had to escape the room due to the fact I couldn't cope with being in the same place with them anymore. They played one song over and over and over again. God, I just know. It was very nice. <laughs> it was very nice. Yeah. And every so often, da 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 That was just, oh. <laughs> I mean, Jimmy Tarbuck, you know the story, but I did do, that was at the gig that he was, um, I, had, I had ordered some ham sandwiches and I went to the toilet. When I came back, they were gone. And uh, I swear to this day that Jimmy Tarbuck had ate those sandwiches because when I came back and said, where are my ham sandwiches? He did that classic. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but it's one of those things. I couldn't prove it was him, but I know it was him. I know. And he lived up to his billing because he wasn't very nice at all mm. in the restroom. Not a nice person. I'm surprised um, they build him like that. They're not very nice yeah. Jimmy Tarbuck. Yeah, <laughs> if he put numbers on the room. <laughs> But also, he was good because afterwards he passed around a bowl that had magic mushrooms in it. <laughs> <laughs> and then his end song was, fly me to the moon. Oh, I'm already there. <laughs> <laughs> he was very comedy literate, though. Very mm. comedy literate, yeah, yeah. That's the end of this particular podcast. And as always, we should say that if you like this, uh, share it with your friends, tell other people about it, um, to download the podcast. Also, if you watch this on YouTube, what you should do is like, subscribe. Uh, in fact, in write a comment underneath if you've got any questions you'd like to ask yeah. us about promoters or anyone involved in comedy you'd like us to talk to. Put that in the comments section. Anything else that I should say? Yes, of course. Uh, oh. I've thought of something, and also yeah. make your own set of uh, bingo comedy bingo cards. Yeah. Well, so when we say Jonglers Portsmouth next time, <laughs> oh yes, house. Yes. You win nothing, but you have the personal pleasure of being comedy literate. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. So we'll see you on the next one. They said you